the big things out in the field when scouting for pest insects is not to just stop there. Oftentimes we go out to scout for aphids, weevils, uh, other types of bad insects, spider mites, for example. But the one thing we always forget to think about scouting for is going to be our beneficial insects. There are dozens of different types of beneficial insects that are present across not just North Dakota, but across the country. And actually, I could probably take that dozens and make it hundreds if you wanted in terms of the number of specimens that are out there. Today, I briefly just wanted to hit three of the big ones that are in the area. First of all, the ladybug. Uh, that is probably one of the biggest ones that you're going to see in parts of the Northwest, North Central, and for the most part throughout North Dakota. Everyone can recognize the ladybug, that small oval uh, quarter inch, it's upwards to a half inch long uh, beetle, often recognized by either red and black or orange and black colorations. The reason they're such fantastic beneficial insects is their ability to feed in high numbers. Let's take the soybean aphid, for example. In a soybean plant, 250 aphids per plant is your economic threshold to spray. Both the adult and the immature ladybug uh, can actually feed on 200 plus aphids per day. So just think about that, your economic threshold, we can already knock out 200 of those aphids out of that 250 just by having them present if they're in high numbers. So when you're scouting, use that net, make sure you're kneeling down to see if they're there. You might be able to prevent an entire chemical application. Another one of those insects would be that of the lacewing. Uh, lacewing, very thin, it's about a centimeter, centimeter and a half long, but really thin body. It actually has really tall wings, if you will, and it's very highly veined. They come in two colors, light green and that of a light brown color. Again, they can feed in high numbers, not just aphids, but different types of mites and other small insects like scale insects. The last one I wanna bring up is the minute pirate bug. When you hear that name, you think minute, you think small, it's about three millimeters long. Pirate bug, I always think of the coloration with dark and white checkered pattern on the wings. These have piercing sucking mouth parts. They can use that piercing sucking mouth part to drive in the back of a mite, an aphid, and they'll begin to eat on that specimen to reduce the level in your field site. The one thing I will say is they tend to have a bad rap. They can bite people as you work through the end of the summer. Of course, as crops start coming out of the field, trees start to lose leaves, that's when they move from those wood agricultural sites into areas where people can be. So while they can have a pretty good bite, they are actually really good insects in the field. Oftentimes in entomology, when we talk about scouting, we talk about using a 15 inch diameter net and being out in the field doing sweep netting. You can see that here, a 15 inch diameter net. Oftentimes we're going to do uh, 20 sweeps uh, at five different field sites when doing that. As I said earlier with the beneficial insects, not only do you want to look for your pest insects, make sure you're looking for your beneficial insects as well. So as you take your sweeps, Go ahead and count the beneficials that be in there too and note what might be there. Having them in high numbers may be that key to preventing a future insecticidal application. It's good to have you from out in Minot. That's one of the cool advantages of, of this platform is we get to reach out to everyone across the state and, and even the country. So it's so awesome to see you and have you on. Do you want to kind of give us a little bit of background? You know, what what's your title and, and what do you do? Well, I'm the crop protection specialist and I'm positioned here at the North Central Research Extension Center in Minot. Um, one of the goals that I have here is really working with some of the pest issues. Uh, that could be both on the entomology, uh, the insect side of things, as well as the plant pathology side of things. So we do a little bit of research here uh, on site as well, uh, really on some different species. You know, recently we've been doing things like red seed sunflower weevil and that of canola flea beetle research here in the Minot area. We're going to hit the ground running because um, as we talked a little bit, you know, of, of your insects and in your videos, you know, those beneficial insects are huge. They're powerful and they are a great advantage because in 2017, the reality of insecticide resistance in soybean aphids, it became real. The story started to unfold and extensive testing in the lab yielded that 
the truth we found in our resistant populations was was pretty alarming. So can you share with our group this morning what was going on and what active ingredients were found to show resistance when it comes to uh, controlling soybean aphids? Well, when I always start to think about this phenomenon, I always think about what is the easiest way to probably to explain this. And I'm a runner. Uh, I can go run, you know, four or five miles a day uh, pretty easily. And when I think about my running, I think about what could motivate me to go further. Okay. So especially in the wintertime, I think about a treadmill, you know, that belt is rotating and it just keeps me going forward, at least until I hit that stop button when I've had enough. But I kind of look at this in the same way. Think of your, uh, think about this as a pesticide treadmill. Really, it is one chemical application that we tend to use repeatedly. Uh, and you know, I've heard this several times growing up in my life. Why fix what isn't broken, right? So if my chemical is continuing to work, uh, why would I really step away from it when I'm getting the response that I really want to have? The problem with that thinking when it comes to chemicals and insecticide resistance really is continuous use of that specific chemical. Uh, as you're going to see here in a moment, we're going to talk about bifrenthrin and lambda sahilothrin is this continuous exposure to it really allows evolution of resistance to occur. So, you know, think about you and me when we're associate with something day after day, it, we evolve to it, we adapt to it. Uh, it just becomes part of what we do, maybe in our habits and how we behave. Well, when you're exposed to a chemical, when the aphid is exposed numerous times, this evolution begins to occur, especially over multiple generations. And for those of you who don't know, aphids actually have two different parts of this life cycle where they can have our sexual reproduction part, you know, your male and female eggs are laid and you get the new generation. But when you're in the summertime, they have the asexual reproduction part. So you're essentially getting a doubling of a population or a cloning of the parent uh, mother aphid uh, really in just a few days, you know, optimal conditions would be about 70, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 70% uh, relative humidity. And at that point, you're doubling that population in five to seven days. So with that, and in other areas of the country, noting insecticide resistance, uh, we worked with the Dr. Jan Canodal uh, Extension Lab uh, on the NDSU campus with funding from the North Dakota Soybean Council to see, is that happening here in North Dakota? Are there populations, are, are there field sites where this evolution has taken place where the chemical doesn't seem to be working as well? And those are going to, in fact, be bifenthrin and lambda sahelithrin. Uh, we had nine counties uh, in eastern North Dakota in 2017 that reported uh, insecticide resistance. Um, we would go out and collect uh, aphids from that field site, uh, put them into a vial, a dose vial that was already coated with that chemical. Uh, we used three different treatments, uh, acetone, uh, bifenthrin, and that of the lambda sahelithrin. And we did that at a kind of a two dose level. So LC99, a one dose, LC lethal concentration, 99% of the population. Then we had the doubling of that. And as we look through that, uh, we saw some interesting responses that come forward. And this is a perfect uh, example of this. And as I look through this, uh, I guess the one thing I wanna call out on that y-axis, you see mortality, okay? So we've gone through with lambda sahelithin in this instance, you can see four hours after exposure. So 1.0, uh, that's 100% control of the soybean aphid population. Uh, 0.4 is 40% control. Uh, of course, laboratory in yellow, that's a population that's been in a growth chamber for many years and has never really seen uh, exposure to chemical. And as you look through that, you see almost 100% control. But as I shift across that x-axis, I see Grafton, you know, 80% control. Asnabrock, you're getting under 10% control. So you're already seeing some issues happening there. Let's go ahead and maybe advance to that next slide and show bifenthrin as well. And you're going to see a similar picture here. Uh, you see the laboratory there, you know, almost 100% control. And that's really what we would like to see. 
But as I come across, I see Emirato, you know, about 30% uh, hope. Uh, I know in that Steel County area, you know, about 25% uh, controllably unfolding there. So you can see perfect examples here where this is beginning to happen in parts of Eastern North Dakota. This is happening. You know, we talked 2017 and, and I know you and I have talked that in, in the current years, you know, luckily we haven't seen it, but it is being monitored and watched. So, uh, Abby, I think let's talk about some seed or insecticide seed treatments. Yeah, I, I have a lot of questions, TJ, because I know a whole lot of nothing about this topic. <laughs> um, so, with the, if, you know, there's a lot of insecticide tre seed treatments for a lot of things. And are there some that help control soybean aphids? Is that another mode of action for this? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, there are actually several different seed treatment opportunities that are available for a soybean aphid uh, control across the soybean belt. But I'm going to kind of leave that with an asterisk because, uh, and actually I was exposed to this when I was working on my PhD. I had another friend uh, at the University of Nebraska working on this very question. And what we began to find out was seed treatments last about 35 to 40 days on average uh, from when it goes in the ground uh, before that begins to wear off. Well, here in the western part of the soybean belt, uh, including here in North Dakota, uh, soybean aphid really isn't here yet. It really hasn't arrived on scene. So as a result of that, while seed treatment can work in other parts of the soybean belt, it's not really uh, that big of a player here in North Dakota, just because a lot of times before aphids are blown here on the upper level winds, they don't really overwinter here very well. That seed treatment has really worn off before you could really get advantage of that. Okay, I could see some cost savings there. If you if you don't apply the seed treatment because it's not going to be effective anyways, that could be some some major you know cash in your pocket, right? Absolutely, uh, that can be a big deal some seasons. So um, I kind of get a question quite often in regards to all right. So how do I know if I have soybean aphids? And, and the first thing you know, Abby, when I work with growers. I, we need to scout for them, right? And because we don't know what we don't know. And so going out into the field and, and TJ kind of alluded this in his video, but we, you know, a lot of times you're going to see those aphids. If you have a high level, you're going to see those aphids on the underneath of the newest soybean leaves out in your field. And, and it, you talked a little bit about thresholds and you mentioned that 250 number. And, and I think that's so important for our growers to, to know and, and to keep in, in the back of their mind, not that you don't have enough things to already think about throughout the growing season, but we really need to look at that threshold at 250 aphids per plant occurring on about 80% of that field. And, and TJ, let's, let's talk into why that's so important and, and why that comes into play with beneficial insects, because I really don't think they get enough credit for how much soybean aphid control they provide. So um, what do we got to think about when we make those applications? You know, we have to remember too, if we make an application, we're probably hurting those beneficials, right, TJ? Absolutely. And I think you hit it, hit the nail right on the head right there is, you know, a lot of times, uh, and, you know, growing up out on the farm, my family was guilty of this too. We'd go out and scout. Uh, do we have aphids there? And, you know, I, I showed you my collecting net in that video. And, you know, that's really one of the early triggers as you're scouting, uh, you're probably not going to be able to use that net necessary to determine the number of population. But as you go through that net, you're probably going to get some of those uh, specimens of aphids that have fallen off into that. And as you get that, that's probably a trigger. Okay, I need to be visiting several field sites uh, within a location to see if I have aphids present and am I at that number. And the interesting there you brought on there is the beneficial side of things. I think a lot of times we go out there and we think 250, 250, 80% uh, of this location, do I need to spray? The one thing that we need to think about is as we scout, just don't scout the pest insects, scout the beneficial insects. And the ladybug is going to be the perfect one that I'm going to talk about. Uh, there are more than 500 species of ladybug uh, in the area. Okay, a very important uh, beneficial insect. And here I'm showing you 
just a select common color schemes that they can have. And this is just a small coloration, you know, I think we're common with these, you know, reds and oranges with these black spots put in, but you can see, uh, especially towards the bottom, you almost have the inverse of that where it's the reds and the oranges that are or more of the spots. Uh, but again, this is just a select few, but as you're scouting, note, what are you seeing out there? And there's no true number to think about, but if you're seeing a decent population out there, rather than coming back from the field and saying, okay, I was at 260 aphids per plant, that number 250 does not mean be out in the field now and spray. That number is actually projected with some wiggle room. So it gives you the chance to say, okay, I'm at 260 aphids today. I'm above threshold. But the cool thing about this is I have a few days that I can step back and say, okay, I saw uh, ladybugs. I saw lace wings out there. Let's go back in 48 hours and do this again, because if you have a high population, you might actually pull that number down. Uh, the convergent ladybug, the seven spotted ladybug is a great example of this. You know, they can feed on 200 aphids per day. The immature, you can see an example of the larva in the smaller onset photo there. They can feed 200 to 300 aphids per day. Well, we're going to throw that 250 aphid number back out there. If, if these populations, one larva can do 300 aphids per day, you can understand their importance at that field site because it might even be enough to pull you below threshold again and maybe prevent a chemical application. That's great. So, so TJ, I'm out there, I'm collecting these bugs. I've got my bug spray on because I kind of don't want to get eaten alive out there. Does that affect the numbers that I get or what I catch in my net or what I see when I'm, when I'm looking for, for insects in the field? Not for these particular types of insects, uh, especially when it comes to the aphids. Uh, you know, they're Aphids with that piercing sucking mouth part, uh, they tend to kind of chill out un underneath the leaves of the soybean plant, especially the newer leaves. And once they kind of get there, they'll actually start expanding uh, across some of the stems and they use that piercing sucking mouth part to kind of anchor themselves onto that plant. So that bug spray that you put to yourself probably really isn't gonna come into play because think about the other wind environments this is North Dakota, always a lot of wind in that area. So that exposure directly to them probably isn't going to be there. You were already at that five minute mark. You know, TJ, is there anything we missed that, that you want to echo to our producers this morning? There's several things I want to think about here. And I guess it's going to be the IPM toolbox, IPM integrated pest management. And, you know, a lot of times we always come back to chemical control. And for me, I guess I always reflect that as the golden tool, uh, golden in quotes there, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a tool that we've kind of we've fallen on reliance quite a bit on. And it's one of those tools that we want to kind of pull ourselves back on if the opportunity allows based on economic thresholds, based on uh, populations of good insects at a specific field site. But also think about some of the other tools that are at hand. You know, one that comes to mind is the canola flea beetle on canola. I can connect myself to cultural control. You know, canola flea beetle is a big deal across the northern part of the state. And if weather conditions allow you, you might have the opportunity, for example, to get planted a little bit earlier before they emerge. And if you can get to a certain uh, growth stage, the plant grows so vigorous, you may not even need to do a type of chemical control. So that's one uh, other type of tool that you can use. Of course, we talked about biological control with the beneficials. The other one is probably going to be host plant resistance. Think about what varieties might be available out there that have some kind of genetic uh, protection there. Uh, I know in the last few years, uh, NDSU released the soybean variety, uh, ND. Uh, 18008 GT. Uh, this is one of them that contains the RAG gene. Uh, RAG is resistance against aphis glycinus, which is scientific name of soybean aphid. So uh, that's just one other option in the toolbox. And if you can um, use one of the other three at your uh, availability to attack that first, that helps protect some of our life cycles for chemicals like bifenthrin, where we're already seeing issues occur. Thank you so much for bringing your expertise. Thank you.